With a strong bond to family, tradition, and home, thousands of Chinese men arrived in North America from troubled South China in the late 1800s to make money to send home for land, which was traditionally viewed as real wealth. They came to find gold in California and then to the Fraser River in British Columbia, and they worked to build the Canadian Pacific Railway. At wages of 50 cents to a dollar a day, compared to seven cents a day in China, visions of giving their families security and land seemed like a dream come true. By 1885, with the railway complete, hundreds of Chinese laborers were out of work. A head tax was imposed by the government at $50 a person, and that meant they could not return home until it and the passage fees were paid back. By 1888, the coal mines of Cumberland were beginning to be worked, and many saw this as the next golden opportunity. When they came to Union, as Cumberland was once called, they were given land to build on. Although it was swampy, with no commercial value, they called it home for the next 50 years. They drained it off as best they could, mound up the earth, and built their town. The wooden structures were practical and sturdy, and sidewalks were created to raise above the mud. The two main streets were Sing Chong Street and Shanghai Alley. They were their own self-sufficient, self-reliant town with grocer, drugstore, tailor, butcher, tobacco and barber shops, as well as restaurants, laundries, shoe shops, hardware stores, and a few herbalists. For entertainment, there were two theaters, fantan houses, lottery houses, judo athletic clubs, a fortune teller, and a number of opium dens. There were very few women and children at the peak of Chinatown from 1910 to 1920. The bachelors made places of entertainment their only source of recreation. By 1904, the head tax was raised to $500, so there was no hope of a man bringing his family over to make a new life in Cumberland, unless he was a successful businessman. The Wellington Collieries Railway ran through the north end of Chinatown. The tracks led to Number 4 Mine. Number 4 had the highest quality coal on Vancouver Island. It employed approximately 400 men, most of Chinese or Japanese descent. Chinese miners were listed as helpers, track layers, and rope riders. Miners working underground wore bright, visible, five-inch open flames on their caps. Fish oil fueled the lamps. The miners would have to be careful to keep these lamps well off the ceiling in certain mines as the flame could pop off the methane gases. These miners, labeled disgustingly capable, worked hard under extremely difficult circumstances and were only paid a fraction of what the white miners received. A paycheck for Wing Hong Chong dated November 13, 1917 for $1,000. A white miner would earn between $3.30 to $5 a day, while a Chinese miner would earn $1.40 to $1.65 a day. But they did the work three shifts a day with non-stop chattering amongst themselves, whether it was the actual mining, laying track for the mines, working with the mules, or picking coal at a table, number four mine prospered because of them. As one could imagine, with these kind of working conditions, tragedy was inevitable. Dunsmere Collieries lists the miners who lost their lives from 1888 to 1964. Two of the worst disasters that occurred in Cumberland took the lives of many miners. February 15, 1901, number six shaft explosion killed 65 miners. Explosions in number four mine in late 1922 and early 1923 took 52 lives. After this, Chinese were strictly forbidden from working underground. The cairn was dedicated in 1986 during Miners Memorial Day by the Cumberland and District Historical Society and others to all the Chinese and Japanese workers who lived and worked in Cumberland from the late 1800s. Sing Chong Street. By 1917 there was hydro in Chinatown. The Chinese were charged 25 cents a day for our loved one light bulb. But when the expected revenue from Chinatown wasn't forthcoming, the collieries sent their chief electrical inspector, Robert Wood, 
to investigate. He discovered that Chinatown had been rewired. All the meters had been bypassed. The little white building next to the pole was the Chinese mission. The church was under control of the Anglican Church for Chinese missions in Canada. From the left, Jack Chow, Tommy Wong, Marie Ma, and Mrs. Finch. Ma Yi is in the window. Mrs. Finch, who only spoke English, was special to the Chinese children. She taught Sunday school, kindergarten, and English at the mission. Mrs. Finch became the bridge between the two cultures. She would later help them through the necessary papers to obtain Canadian citizenship. 1916, a minister, his wife, and child in front of the church. The 1940 wedding of Chao Chi, eldest son of Chao Li. His bride was brought over from China. The ceremony was held upstairs in the Masonic Hall. On the right is George Apps. The children love to hear his wonderful Bible stories at church. The Chinese National League played an important role in the business, political, and welfare of their community. Wherever groups of Chinese laborers gathered in North America, Chinatowns developed. A National League card and pin. They did not conform to North American ways, so they sustained each other with the comforts and traditions of their Chinese culture. The Chinese Freemasons Hall, or Qi Kong Tong, was built in the 1890s. The Freemasons were a benevolent society, unlike its political Chinese counterpart. The Freemasons Hall also housed the Benevolent Association. At various times, the Benevolent Society provided soup kitchens, shelter, and even Chinese tutors for the children. They kept watch over the Chinese community as a whole and took care of any individual in need. The Dark Coon Club was a branch of the Freemasons. They were considered the more militant arm of the Freemasons and also the most loyal and trustworthy. On the balcony is Ma Lip Sui, president of the club. The Dark Coon Club was entered by invitation only. They took great pride in taking care of the sick, elderly, poor, and lonely. The building was demolished in 1968. The Chow Lee Company Store. It was a hardware and general store. Chow Lee was also the treasurer for the Masonic Hall. The Chow family in 1923. From the left is Mamie, Hazel, Mrs. Chow, Baby Bill, Mr. Chow, Park, and Archie. Three of the boys. Bill on the left, Wayne and Park on their bikes in front of the Chow Lee store. Park Chow joined the Canadian Infantry in 1945. His brother Bill also served in the Second World War. They were stationed in India and Malaya. Lila Wong served in the Women's Army Corps Survey Division. Lila was also the first Chinese Canadian to be franchised to vote in 1947. The main floor of this building was the Sun On Wall Company, a Chinese general merchandise store with stationery and drug supply and the butcher. The second floor, a restaurant, and the third floor was a rooming house. The owner of this store was Liu Hock Shun. Most of the gentlemen seated are his sons. Liu Hock Shun was one of the most prominent businessmen in Chinatown. The woman on the right of Liu Hock Shun is his first wife, Chang Shi. They had been married in China. Liu Hock Shun came to North America alone after several trips back to China, resulting in births of two girls, Mr. Lo, as Chinese custom allowed, chose a second bride in Victoria, still hoping for a son. Pan Ji is seated to Mr. Lo's left. She arrived in Cumberland about 1904 and was only the second Chinese woman there. Mr. Lo's first wife, Chang Shi, arrived a few years later. Although Pan Shi's first child was also a girl, Annie, the eight more children that follow with both marriages produced eight boys in a row. From the left, Bill, Clifford, Charles, Annie, Pan Shi, George, Lo Hak Shun, David, Shang Si, Wilbur, and Philip. Youngest son Ken had not arrived yet. All of the boys and Annie were born in Cumberland, Chinatown. 
Chiang Si went back to China in 1931 after only a few years in Cumberland. Annie married a young newcomer named Liang Gang. He started out as a miner at number four mine. And after an accident, he decided to farm. He then became a store owner where he sold his own produce. He was so successful, he also opened a store in Courtney. That store is still run by his son, Norm. The Cumberland store was sold in February 1997, as son Johnny Liang retired. The Cumberland Museum and Archives proudly displays the sign that hung outside of Liang's for years. In March 1997, during ceremonies, Johnny turns on the sign. Lo Hak Shun around 1938. Aside from owning the Sun On Hua Company, he was also president of the Chinese Benevolent Association and the Cumberland Chinatown Masonic Club, the largest gambling hall in Chinatown. Dominoes and gambling chips shown with an abacus. A gambling table. Mr. Lo owned and operated a theater and brought in live entertainment and movies. He was also a ticket agent for the CP Liners, and he brought a teacher from China to teach the Chinese children. When Lo Huck Shun passed away in 1948, thousands mourned. He was well known from Victoria to China because of his business connections. A royal car was used to lead the funeral procession. At a Chinese funeral, a nickel and a candy was given. The candy was to take away any bitterness you felt toward the deceased, and the nickel was to share their prosperity. Lo Hak Shun's sons dressed in a traditional white sash. The food and gifts are for Mr. Lo to take to his afterlife. As the Chinese funeral proceeded from Chinatown through the main street in Cumberland, it was often led by a brass band. The band told every child in Cumberland that there would be lots of goodies left at the cemetery, but what the men liked best were jugs of whiskey. Once a year, the Chinese would go to the cemetery and exhume the bones that were due to be dug up every five or seven years. They were to be polished, packaged, and returned to China for a proper burial. This was done so the devil would not possess them and bring them back to earth as a vicious dog. There were very few women and children in Chinatown, but the few children that were there were pampered. Between the Lo and Chow families, there were almost 20 children. They played together and were very close in ages. From the left is Harold Hing Lim, Jack Chow, David Ho Lo, and Kwang Jeng Jong. This little one is Marie Ma in 1927. In order for Marie to have her picture taken, she had to sit still for approximately two minutes. To make the small child sit so long, they bribed her with peanuts. Unfortunately, they took them away from her just before the photo was taken. Marie remembers being just a little upset about that. Marie's parents were Ma Lip Sui and Mrs. Ma. Mr. Ma, the owner of Tom Keys, a general store in Chinatown, was president of the Dart Coon Club, the Ma Society, secretary of the Chinese Benevolent Association, and was assistant in the British Columbia Welfare Department. Marie was an only child. She's here with her mum in 1934. Here children are maypole dancing at the Empire Day celebrations. This event is still held every May in Cumberland. The boy on the left is Quan Jake Singh. Next is Mamie Chow. The girl in white is Lily Wong. And the other boy in front is Kim Ma. The early 1900s. Both the Chinatown and Japanese community located and settled at Bevan. These gentlemen are standing outside Charlie Sing Chong's new store at number seven mine at Bevan. The man on the left is Ma Kim, the storekeeper. At the far right is Tan K. Yuan. He was a laundryman. Gentleman standing outside a laundry. The man in the middle is Kwong Jen. He was a cook. From left to right are Sam Dur Fong, Kwong Jen, the cook, an unidentified man, and Kwong Poen. Dorothy Chiu. The Chinese girls wore fine imported silks, lacquered their hair, and wore makeup. 
This sometimes caused animosity between the Chinese and white community teenage girls. In 1923, legislation was passed called the Oriental Exclusion Act. This stopped all new laborers from coming from China. Coal began to decline in value as oil became available. The Chinese miners began to leave Cumberland to seek new work. As they grew older, they gravitated to Vancouver, which became the largest Chinatown in the province. In 1936, a kitchen fire spread across the street and down towards Number 2 Mine, almost reaching Sun on Wa Company. Chinatown was now turning into a ghost town. The railway no longer ran up to Cumberland. The tracks were torn up for scrap during the war. But still, several older Chinese men would call this their home until they died. By the time the last mine closed in 1966, the few old men that were still here remembered when Shanghai and Xingchong streets were flowing with people. Chinatown in the winter of 1965. Chu Hong at the age of 88 in Chinatown in 1967. Chu Hong had worked on the coal ships in Union Bay until he retired in the 1950s. Ma Wee Wing stands with the Masonic Hall in the background. He lived in Cumberland until his death in 1983. Ma Fun in 1967 in his house in Cumberland, Chinatown. He was 80 years old. Funding to rebuild Chinatown was not found, and there were no concrete foundations to build on. Most of Chinatown was just shacks, and the weather was taking its toll on the wooden structures. Sing Chong Street, the low main street. Going off to the right was Shanghai Alley, the high street, and the older part of Chinatown. One well-remembered resident is Wang Gang, locally known as Jumbo. He was born in 1898. Jumbo came to Cumberland to work in the mines around 1918. Jumbo lived in the original pay office of the Union Collieries. The little building was built around 1880. At one time, the building was also used as a jail. Around 1930, Jumbo made the cabin his home. Jumbo always had his stovepipe sticking out of the window because he said it saved heat. Sam Dorfong's cabin is on the left with a steep roof, and Jumbo's cabin with a walking stick hanging by the front door. Jumbo then moved into Cumberland in the early 60s, then on to Vancouver where he passed away in 1982. Jim Ellis Sr. at Jumbo's cabin in 1972. Mr. Ellis was a miner from the early 1900s. Cumberland restored Jumbo's cabin and moved it up the hill behind the village as a dedication to the Cumberland Chinese. It stands today on Comox Lake Road. By the 1960s, there was a bottle digging period where every sod in Chinatown was overturned. Bottles were plentiful and had been used to shore up the swampland. People came from all over North America to pick through Chinatown. Bottle pickers were a constant nuisance. There are stories of these pickers going into homes that were still occupied and taking the bottles right off the tables. A miner's fish oil lamp and soft peak cap and some of the bottles that became treasures. Pottery, glassware and bottles, a water pipe and opium lamp, and some medicine bottles. By 1968, after the pickers had been through and age and weather had taken its toll, there was no hope left for Chinatown. There was nothing that could be done to save or restore the remaining buildings, so they were burned down. Every summer, the Cumberland Chinese have a reunion in Stanley Park in Vancouver. Wilford, Jack, and Harold Lim. Jack and Andrew Marr, they are both doctors. They share memories and photographs as well as good food and company. Hazel Chow, when asked if she had a childhood photo, she mentioned that most of the little girls were kept in the home to do women's chores. But Hazel points out that she is in the upper right window of the Chow Lee Company. These cute little fellows, the Chow boys at the reunion in 1983. These are gentlemen of the Cumberland Chinatown Reunion. The fellow with the cane is a man who grew up next to Chinatown. 
The Chinese boys called him their great protector. His name is Jack Marpole, and he stayed friends with them as adults. These are the ladies of the Cumberland Chinatown reunion, with Doug Ma, who slipped into the shot. On the far left is Marie Ma. She was the baby that didn't get the peanut. Next to her is Viola Ma, then Doug, Josie Wong, Annie Fong, Joyce Leung, and Mei Leung. The group in 1983. Misty, a painting by Stephen Lowe and dedicated to Cumberland's Chinatown. The world famous artist came to Cumberland in 1956 to live with his grandfather. Stephen wrote along the side of this beautiful painting, Misty. Canada, British Columbia, Cumberland. A long time ago, my grandfather told me the expatriate elders who first arrived to this land numbered in the thousands. They all gathered to live in Cumberland. Most of them were miners. During that time, gambling houses, theaters, and restaurants filled the streets of our booming little town. Later on, the mining stopped. Some of the foreign miners returned home to China or elsewhere. Others moved on to different parts of Canada or to early graves. Most of the houses that once populated Cumberland are now burned down. During the early days, Cumberland was booming. Now it's a ghost town. When I first came to this country, I lived in this quiet town for a few months and then moved on. However, even though I left, I will always consider Cumberland to be my hometown. Whenever I revisit this special place, its people and its surroundings, I am struck by how different it is from what it used to be. Only a scant handful of original miners still remain compared to thousands before them. Only a few leaky, desolate shacks remain standing to remind us of the once burgeoning town and leave me in a melancholy mood. However, I keep close to my heart what the old seniors told me of this once thriving town as I stand alone in the empty streets. This painting is dedicated to the memory of Cumberland's Chinatown. China was the brightest star on my horizon when I was younger. My name is Colleen Leung. I'm a third generation Chinese Canadian and a mother of two half Chinese children. I'm also a journalist. Growing up, I hated being Chinese. My grandfather came from China, poor and desperate, in 1925. But by the time he died, he owned two grocery stores and rich farmland on Vancouver Island. Although he was a man of few words, Grandpa taught us all that family came first. Grade one, I wasn't picked for a softball team. I always felt it was because I was Chinese. But my family pretended everything was fine. Whenever someone called us names, we put on a brave face. It only made me feel worse. When I was about nine, I um, got it into my head that it would be better if I was white. So I would just sit in the bathtub with a can of Ajax cleanser and, and try to get the color off. 
as if that would solve my problem. It was so hard growing up in a place where yours was virtually the only Chinese family. You know, when you're going to school, everyone around you was white. Um, on the surface, you know, you play the same, you speak the same language, but you never quite feel like you belong. As a teenager, I joined the first tour of Chinese Canadians to go to communist China. It was 1974. I didn't know what to expect, but what I saw convinced me that China was one big happy family with Chairman Mao as our father. I thought Mao was great because he took charge. He was great because he made foreign leaders listen to him. To me, that was the ultimate. I became infatuated with the idea of being Chinese. On my first trip to China, the tour guide knew everyone's family history. He told me that Grandpa Liang had children living in a village in Sunhui County, south of Canton, and they were still there. My grandpa had two wives. He was supporting two sets of children at the same time. Why hadn't I heard about it before? I never knew about China. I didn't, I didn't know anything. You must have known that he had another family. No. You didn't know that no. before? No, no. My mother and dad just covered it up and didn't want to talk about it. I don't know how old before I knew that. No. I knew he had relations in China. I knew he sent money back to China. Your dad had well, two wives. How did you, okay, what do you our think of mom, that? Our mom would be really upset. I don't know. I don't think our, we would be. We just consider them an extended family. But I think her mom would be very upset because I'm sh well, it's just natural. I really of can't course. say until it happens. You don't know how yeah. these, how you would react. Yeah. Living in a country like Canada, where you get a mix of what's really traditional and what's and what's mm -hmm. acceptable in this part of the world, and you never thought anything of it. I never really thought much about it. No. That it was illegal or it was wrong or well, I don't want anything to do with it. Right, because we never <laughs> mentioned it to anybody. But because you know we. You just pick up, you just know these things, you know, when you're growing up, you know what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. So if it's not acceptable to have two wives, we're not going to talk about it because, you know, it's just natural. <laughs> My Canadian relatives didn't feel the way I did. They wouldn't talk about China or about their brother and two sisters. <laughs> I felt such a connection with everyone in the village of Dijak. We're all named Liang, all from the same ancestor a long time ago. My grandpa's life is not a series of dates of when he arrived and when he conceived children and when he went back to China, although, although those are important too. He had a lot of duty, which he observed. He had responsibilities, and he never shirked them. He had a responsibility to the wife in China, so he sent money home for 46 years. He, he didn't see her after 1924, but he sent the money home anyway. The first time I saw you, I thought, oh, you are so smart that you could find your way to China. It's like I said, you can come here, but we can't go to your place. It's so far away. Whenever you come back, we are very happy. Everyone wants to see you.
On my most recent visit to the village, I threw a big party for our closest relatives just outside Grandpa's old house. I decided that I would have to continue taking care of this side of the family. <laughs> The first time I went to the village, I was 24 years old. I badly needed to fit in. I had very long hair, and I wore it in two braids, and I wore Chinese clothes, and they were like really ugly. I mean, they were <laughs> they were ill-fitting, and um, and and totally asexual and not attractive at all, which was which was the whole part and parcel of communist China that men and women were you know nobody was a sex object and I showed up at the village and I don't know what they they must have thought that I must have been a nutcase because here I came from this rich country like Canada and I was dressed like them what a disappointment <laughs> I was imagining I could live in my grandfather's village even in his house I didn't realize until later that my finding his house was bittersweet for my relatives. When I see you, it's like seeing my father. I never saw my father. He left before I was born, then he died. Now there's no way to see him. I have something. Eh? Tell her I have something I want to show her. What is it? Let me see. 1914. He was 25 when he went to Canada. I, I don't know. My big brother had been born, but not my big sister. My mother was pregnant with my sister when he left the first time. My elder sister is 10 years older than me, and my brother is 13 years older than I am. My life was better than my elder sister's because at least I had enough to eat. My sister never had a full stomach. Grandpa went to Canada because he had a terrible life here. He had two brothers and his eldest brother was a bully. His big brother didn't work. He was an opium addict. So he was always demanding money from the two younger brothers. But they didn't have any because they were only farmers. Grandpa couldn't take it anymore so he ran away to Canada. He borrowed $60 from his father-in-law to pay for his passage. After 1923, Chinese weren't allowed to come and go from Canada as they pleased. So my grandfather stayed in Canada for good. He married my grandma, Annie Lowe, after settling in Cumberland. It was an arranged marriage, more of a business transaction. Eventually, she found out he already had a wife in China. My grandmother raised seven children at the same time as running the grocery store. The kids worked the vegetable farm all of them making as much money as they could to send home to Grandpa's first wife. My mother didn't cry much when my father married again. 
My father told my mother, our son is already 30 years old, soon you'll have a daughter-in-law who can serve you. But I don't have anyone to serve me in Canada. Shall I marry another woman? My mother said, yes, that would be all right. She can serve you and wash your clothes. My mother was very reasonable and not narrow-minded. My father also sent some money so his son could buy some land to farm. My brother already had a house to live in. My mother didn't get upset as long as he could send money home so we would have something to eat. I wondered if there was another reason my grandpa sent money for as long as he did. What if his first wife had been the only one he loved his whole life? And what if my grandmother knew about it? He had the wife in China, which he left behind with the kids. He got a new wife in Canada, and he needed both these wives. But I think the wives also needed each other because the wife in China needed the money from Canada. The money was made on the farm, yes, but also in the store by my grandmother here who ran the store. She was sending money home. My grandma here, she needed that wife to stay in China, more importantly, or else her life would be wrecked here. I mean, it's sort of a weird love triangle, but I think it was a love triangle. When you were younger, did you know your dad was sending money home to this other family in China? Did you know that? I think we knew it. We knew, but I don't, know how, I don't know how young we would be. No, I know, I don't know. We didn't know until we were fairly old, I would say. Did it come as a shock to you when we found those letters and you found out what was in them? No, because no, mom, it mom, shock. Told, not to me, because mom would mention that there was a family back there, and, and, and that's where mom would tell us why we're working so hard because he needs to send money back. We knew, we always knew that. He was actually like looking after this family and he was looking after that family like he no, worked so hard he never that. had time for himself he was so you know working so hard supporting two families you know so he's a real hard worker and he's a good businessman he's quite successful I, I, think. I, 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 I always kind of knew that so i wasn't shocked but it's not until now that when we read those letters ourselves but I didn't really know find what out. was going on back oh, then. No, find out no. how their life was. Well, I don't think we were just kids, you know, and I don't think our parents would want to burden us with all this stuff, you know? Last year, I was in Hong Kong on my way to China for the first time in 18 years. That's when I found out that my grandpa's eldest daughter was still alive. I hoped she could tell me a few things about him. My aunt is the only one on this side of the Pacific who saw my grandpa in person. I don't know what I expected her to say, but she wasn't too pleased to see me. She wouldn't even look at me. I don't remember. That was so long ago. I didn't see my father for a long time. He left in May, and I was born in September. When I was seven, he came back again. I was very afraid of him. I ran out of the house and refused to go back home. Afterwards, when my younger sister was born, he had already returned to Canada. He stayed there. He took a younger wife, a concubine. And he had several sons. I found a letter that my aunt had written to my grandfather. It said, Dear father, my marriage has turned out badly because my husband ran away with another woman. My son and daughter have to help me farm, even though they're very young. And my stomach's always upset because I only eat thin gruel every day. But I think about you and how old you are, so I don't dare to ask you for any more help. My grandfather received many letters sent from the village asking him to come home 
to arrive by riverboat from Hong Kong. Just before liberation, my father said he wanted to come back with everyone from Canada. But he read about liberation in the newspaper, and he decided not to come back. No, it wasn't like that at all. In 1947, your father sent a letter to my father saying he wanted to bring all his children home. But he only had enough money to come to China. He didn't have enough to go back to Canada. So he said it would be better if he didn't come. One of his daughters was very sick, so he had to spend the money treating his daughter. That's what the letter said. We have received the $400 you sent. We've given $200 to your son and the other half to the school. Someone told us you want to come back to the village, but your second wife won't allow it. My grandmother was the daughter of one of the richest men in Cumberland's Chinatown. He had two wives. She was the daughter of the second wife. Chinatown was like the Wild West with boardwalks and old wooden facades. My grandmother became a concubine when she married him. She became a second-class wife, just like her own mother. Her own children would call her sister, and they would call the first wife, who was not their mother, mother. What made it worse was that Grandpa was probably always thinking of his first family in China. And when he lost his eyesight, it was my grandmother who had to send the packages and the money. My mother in Canada must have really liked me. She sent silk scarves in yellow, sometimes green or red. I wore them around my neck. I wore her shoes, which had very high heels. I used to stumble around in them. She's against the family from China coming to Canada. She was really so afraid that those relatives would come? Oh, it's a nightmare for her if they did. She's afraid. Oh, I know. You think she got rid of all the other letters? Oh, no doubt about it. When my grandfather died, I was five. It couldn't have happened at a worse time, because in 1960, it was one of the three bad years in China, when millions of people starved to death. And when he passed away, there were no more letters, and there was no more money, because my grandfather wasn't there to organize it. And so the relatives in China had no one to look after them. The more I got to hear the story of my relatives, and how they survived the really hard years in China, the more angry I got that my Canadian family refused to help. After Grandpa died, it was a long time before the Canadian side sent a letter. Nothing came. We sent a letter to Grandmother, but she didn't reply, even though she knows Chinese. She said she was too old and it wasn't convenient for her to write. At the time, no one in the countryside knew any English, so we lost touch. I say Mao Zedong brought a very bad life for us in the early stages of communism. And later, at the end of 1967, when the Cultural Revolution started, it was a nightmare all over again. There was nothing to eat. Only three ounces of rice with each meal and a couple of sweet potatoes. Or we had sweet potatoes instead of rice. At the time, I ate sweet potatoes every meal, and I always got diarrhea. I would bleed whenever I went to the bathroom. I found out just last year how my family in the village survived after Grandpa died. It was my eldest cousin, Gin Wei, the one Grandpa tried to get to Canada, but he only got him as far as Hong Kong. I remember when I was in grade one, 
You had someone bring back a bucket of mincy with fat pork and sugar. It was really tasty. Big pieces of pork, nice and sweet. We were all depending on you because you were in Hong Kong. We didn't have anything to eat at home. I know, I know. Some old people starved to death. But it's not really up to the siblings to look after another sibling, is it? The parents look after the children to a certain age, but then I never thought of it because I didn't think it was our job to look after our siblings because by then it's just siblings, right? I don't know. I never really thought about it. And we didn't know them, you know. If we knew them personally, you know, the feelings probably would have been different, but uh, we didn't know them. It was just somebody in the distance, you know. It wasn't anywhere that we really knew, so. And anyway, being a girl of the family, no. you don't, you don't take Girls responsibility. Girls aren't too important. When, when you're, you're married, married you're supposed to belong to the other family. During certain times, they really had a difficult time mm -hmm. of living. Would you have liked to have known earlier more about them? Not really, because then we had a, we had a difficult time too. Yeah, we had, Didn't own, we? We had our own struggles, so. I mean, like I said, we had to go work on the farm. I had to go work on the farm three days a week. I had to quit school. I mean, I didn't really have a, no, I mean, a childhood. My cousin Jin Nam welcomed me home. I'd first set foot in my grandfather's house in 1979. This was the house he'd built for his first family with money made in Canada. Entering was like unlocking the secret meaning of my own life. I needed this house to always remain like this. And I expected my cousin's family to continue living here in these primitive conditions just for me. There were photos of me in the living room, me and the whole Canadian clan. It was so eerie. The old house had not changed since my last visit after all. The old furniture, the same pictures on the walls. My cousin had moved his family to a new house down the lane. I was disappointed, but at the same time, I was relieved that they had somehow managed to raise the money without help from Canada. They're simple country folk. They're not at all sophisticated but they're genuine. And if I'm from the same grandpa, then I'm their family too. They were very warm, and they made it easy to get to know them. I couldn't get China out of my system. I decided to live in the People's Republic and prove that I really was more Chinese than anything else. You know, to be in a country where everyone has black hair and dark eyes, you know, everyone looks like you, and you just blend in with the crowd, it was like a dream. And then I had this opportunity in 1980 to work in Beijing, and I worked for China Central Television as a translator and a, like a, a cultural consultant. And every morning, I would go and I would sit with my comrades, because at that time we were calling them comrades, and we would watch satellite news broadcasts from the Indian Ocean. So we'd get two feeds, and I'd see things like um, shootings 
in El Paso, Texas, and then I'd see the bathtub races in Nanaimo, and I'd see, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger came out of retirement, this is before he got really famous, to take the Australian title or, wait, you know, bodybuilding whatever title, and, and then Mae West died, and, the, and John Lennon was shot, and you know, Prince Charles married Diana, and, and those were the highlights of my sitting in those little rooms with my Chinese comrades, trying to explain to them who these people were, and, and watched Reagan get shot. And, um, and I was the reference, I had to explain who they were and why it was important, whether we should run it in the news. It was a great job, it was a terrific, terrific job. They gave me this book, and it's um, it's a little brocade book. It was presented to me in 1981 by the Communist Party of China at China Central Television, because I was like just a just a notch lower than what they used to call a model worker, and a model worker is somebody who totally um, devotes themselves to their to their jobs. Being in China, living in China, and functioning successfully in China was, was a source of pride for me. And so I wanted to stay forever, but that wasn't going to happen. My boyfriend at the time was American, and I'm trying really hard to be Chinese, and, but, but assuming that I have the rights of a foreigner, which means I can go anywhere a foreigner goes. And so I walked into that hotel believing I had the rights of a foreigner. And they looked at me, and they saw a Chinese girl. When the Communist Party Congress opened here on September 1st, China's leadership declared Chinese must resist Western influences. Two foreigners were involved in an incident here with police. Jim Laurie is an American reporter resident here in Peking, and Colleen Leong is a Canadian working here as a translator. The two were meeting in this hotel. The police mistakenly thought the Canadian woman was a Chinese citizen and further said incorrectly that her Canadian passport was invalid. The police detained the two and questioned them for seven and a half hours. The police would not let them call their embassies. The American reporter was fined $25 for incorrect hotel registration. All I can say is that I myself feel, feel very disappointed that after, after many years of studying China, of trying to promote China, and, and um, things that are going on in China that uh, I'm very disappointed that I put so much energy and work and everything into it that they, they would be very, very rough with me. Four years ago, China decided to open its doors to the world. But the decision to do so was not unanimous. And there are still many, many people in this country who do not want outsiders looking in. And we go to any lengths to stop Chinese from assuming Western values and lifestyles. Robert Hurst, CTV News from Peking. China had already rejected my grandfather. Now it was rejecting me. Unlike my childhood, it was becoming fashionable in the West to have a Chinese face, which made my transition back to Canada a little easier. When I came home at the end of 1982, a few months after that incident, I, um, I sort of shut that door on that part of my life that wanted to be Chinese anymore. Well, then I tried really hard to belong in Canada again. <laughs> you know, I just, then I had to, I had to adapt to that. And, um, and I got a job at CBC Radio, which was lucky. And, uh, and worked my way through radio. Traveled around, got into being a Canadian. I missed the bamboo groves in the village in China, but I built a new life and a new identity for myself in Canada. You know any swinging songs? No. There's no blooms out now. I married my high school sweetheart, and now we have two young daughters who are half Chinese. Okay. Yeah, it is. Even though China has become more of a hobby than the driving force in my life, it still took years to forgive my Canadian relatives for keeping such a secret.
you can examine other people's lives and you can ask them to spill their guts. But when you have to spill your own, who are you spilling it to? And do you really want to hear, hear how vulnerable you are? Do you really want to admit that you were wrong about so many things? Thanks to my grandpa, my uncle had a grocery store to manage when he graduated from high school. My dad ran the Cumberland store, where I had my first job. It was what my grandpa wanted all along. It has to be filled up. People like to buy from a full stand. I now understand why, of everyone in my family, I was the one who had to shake the foundations of the house my grandfather built in Canada. My Western education tells me I have a right to know. My journalist training demands I find the truth. But as a Chinese person, I have to be respectful and accept how my relatives fulfilled their duty. You're up town pretty early this morning. I am. I did not sleep before. Were you trying to beat the birds? <laughs> if I were totally honest, I would have admitted a long time ago that um, perhaps what I'm asking my relatives to do is impossible for them to do. I'm asking for them to tell me about the most painful part of their growing up. I had to quit. I had to quit school. There was no... I had to help out family and uh, everybody had to eat and... You didn't... You didn't feel angry about that or just well I I felt uh, I wanted to uh, continue but uh, dad says uh, if we're going to survive you'll have to quit school so Cyril and I quit school in 40 <laughs> excuse me 1947 and uh, Joyce quit in 1950 and I think it was May graduated in 1954. I forgot what year Freddie graduated, though. By then, I was so busy, I didn't know. I wasn't minding much at anything at home. I was on the road and down the farm and in the store. I had three jobs I was doing. Those years, the Courtney store was getting built, and then the Cumberland store expanded. I mean, all the money was just stretched out to its limit. And then, of course, when he built the Courtney store, to borrow money. So this is when we had really had a struggle to meet our obligations, plus paying the debt off. Now you can see why that we worked so hard <laughs> and put all those hours in and uh, working in the farm, the store, and on the truck. Did you want them to come? Well, I, I wasn't too sure if I really wanted them to come because uh, I thought if they did come that uh, although Cyril and I share the same bedroom, what, what are we going to do? <laughs> if they came, we have to share three or four to one bedroom, and that would be pretty difficult because <laughs> there's only room for two beds. <laughs> I blamed my family in Canada for neglecting the family in China for a long time. And then I realized that if they had sent the money after my grandpa died, if they'd sent the money in the 60s, it would have been bad for my family in China because the 60s were the Cultural Revolution. And we find out later that during the Cultural Revolution, if you had contact, direct contact with anyone in the West, you would have your house and all your belongings confiscated. It was kind of unfortunate. Mum didn't give us more of a detail of what transpire over there in China and Canton, which is sad, really. You know, you can't help but feel that uh, 
you didn't help your family as much as you could have. But I guess you can say things have passed now, and uh, if you and I could get over there and see what their conditions are, maybe we might feel pretty sad that we didn't do a little bit more sooner. Times have really changed in China. When I went to the village last year, I was invited for the first time to take part in ceremonies at the grave sites near my grandfather's village. Women never used to be allowed, but now they seem to be in charge. My village cousins had to clean off the headstones before laying out the offerings, which symbolized food and clothing for our ancestors in heaven. We burned incense. I even got my first opportunity to make an offering of wine and to burn the fake money. At least now, my Chinese family had real money to buy the things they needed to perform this ritual. And after we performed the ritual at my great-grandfather's gravesite, we moved to another hill where we cleared the weeds and sacrificed at the grave of my grandfather's first wife, the woman he left behind. It was important that I pay my respects to Grandpa's first wife as a representative of the Canadian side of the family. But there was no ceremony for my grandfather. He was buried in Canada, and his remains are being looked after by my uncles and aunts and my parents. In Cumberland's Chinese graveyard, where my grandfather's buried, my mother is finally invited to lead the ceremony. Shall you lead another two in uh, infant together? So we had our Happy New Year, and they have their half Happy New Year. I used to be on a crusade to save my relatives in China, and I worried about them. I worried whether they had enough to eat. But in the end, I neglected them too, because I stopped writing to them for many years, and I felt very guilty. I had great fears when I went back this last time that when I got there that they would ask me either for money or help to get to Canada. But neither of those things happened. They didn't ask me for anything. They were just glad to see me. <laughs> Come on.
It was a hard lesson for me. I had to go halfway around the world to understand the importance of family and to learn how to forgive. Yeah, right.